Good morning. morning. You know, from time to time, a request is made of the preacher. Hard to believe, I know. Even harder to believe is when the preacher actually follows through with the request. But from time to time, we're asked to preach on a certain subject. And this morning is such a day. There was an individual that is a member of this congregation that asked me if I would preach on our subject for today. And I said I would. And from time to time, as you can probably tell, I go out into the sun with no sunscreen. (laughs) And from time to time, I will use PowerPoint and those kind of things. So we'll pray that everything goes according to the plan today. And I think we recognize that the world we live in today, there's a lot of pluralism. And by that we mean everybody thinks everybody else is okay. I'm okay. You're okay. We're okay. Everything's just okay. Well, the Bible does not teach that. And on today's subject, which Lord willing, again, everything will work according to the plan and to the pattern, our subject for this morning will be baptism. Is baptism necessary for salvation or is it only an empty ritual? And when everything is boiled down, that's all it can be. Baptism has to be something that is commanded by God in order to be saved or it is something that is just a ritual. It's just something that we go through like our morning routine where we wake up in the morning, we wash ourselves, we brush our teeth, we comb our hair, get dressed, whatever our routine is. It may be something that is just that empty or it is something required of God. So what we want to do this morning, again, we're going to address the subject of baptism. We're going to be using the PowerPoint. Hopefully everything, I'll stick to this pretty well and won't deviate too far from the PowerPoint. And we'll be able to see everything that I've been able to think. I've tried to put on this so that you'll be able to see it. Some people may want to follow along in the Bible. That's fine. That's always better. But let's go ahead and get started. We're going to look at this from three different questions that we're going to ask in regard to the subject of baptism. The first one, what is baptism? Now as we note, there are several different types of baptisms mentioned throughout the New Testament. One would have not to have to go very far into his or her New Testament before we run across this subject or this thought. The first baptism that we'll note very briefly is that of John's baptism. John's baptism was a baptism in water. It was requiring repentance. It was for the remission of sins. And this is the baptism that Jesus himself was administered by John. Now one thing that is interesting about John's baptism from all the evidence in the New Testament, John's baptism and John the Baptist's ministry never went outside of Judea. Everything in regard to John's baptism was only for the nation of Israel. It was only for the Jews. John himself also mentioned our next one, that is Holy Spirit baptism. John the Baptist himself, John the Baptizer, John the Immerser made this very clear. That where they stood, there would be one coming after him. And that's what John's work was, was preparatory for Jesus Christ. But John said, there would be one coming after me, greater than me, that will baptize you, some standing there, in the Holy Spirit. We recognize that the Holy Spirit is the third member of the Godhead. Where it is beyond any question that Holy Spirit baptism occurred is in Acts chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Where the apostles were gathered together and they were immersed in the Holy Spirit. The third baptism that we noted going through the Bible is the baptism of fire. Some may say that the baptism of fire and Holy Spirit baptism are the same. I deny that. That is not the case. When one reads Matthew 3 and verse 11 in that context, the fire is equal to the wrath and the judgment that was to come. So the Holy Spirit baptism was a positive thing that from the Bible was only for the apostles, but the baptism of fire is something that is in regard to punishment. It is not equal to Holy Spirit baptism. In Luke 12 and verse number 50, Jesus says he had to undergo a baptism of suffering. He was going to endure extreme duress upon the cross and he likened that unto a baptism and that is a baptism of suffering. 
One of the more difficult passages in the Bible is in regard to baptism for the dead. Though it is right in the midst of Paul's great dissertation, his inspired dissertation upon the resurrection. But there was such a thing as baptism for the dead. I believe that would be those that were immersed who did not believe in the resurrection. So it was useless. There was no point behind this whatsoever. Well, notice also from Hebrews 6 and verse number 2, there was a baptism of the Old Testament. That was more along the lines of a ceremonial washing type deal. Not so much as what we read about in the New Testament, but the Hebrew writer does mention that. And then we'll note what Jesus says after he is bodily resurrected and before he ascends into heaven. We generally call this Great Commission Baptism or the Apostolic Commission, something in along those lines where Jesus specifically tells His 11 apostles at the time to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. However, as we continue on, by the time Paul was inspired to write the book of Ephesians, only one valid baptism remained. Now notice what Ephesians 4 and verse number 5 says where it's right in the midst of the seven ones as those that have read that have noticed that where we have religious unity. There are grounds for religious unity. Paul, Paul writes by inspiration in Ephesians 4 and verse 5 there is one Lord, there is one faith, and there is one baptism. Now in spite of all those other things that we just talked about, by around the year of what we consider the prison epistles, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, probably Hebrews and Philemon, there was only one valid baptism that remained. Now notice this, and we've discussed this at previous times and in divers ways and different manners. This baptism that remains cannot be miraculous. It cannot be something supernatural. Holy Spirit baptism was supernatural. It endowed the apostles with supernatural gifts so that as they went out preaching the gospel of Christ to everyone, there was nothing that would hinder them from getting the gospel of Christ out. We note that the age of the miraculous has ceased. If one miraculous gift remains, then all of them would. There are no miracles that happen today. Notice also it cannot be anything associated with the Old Testament. The Old Testament has been taken out of the way and nailed to the cross of Jesus Christ. When one honestly and diligently studies the Old Testament, he or she will recognize that the Old Testament and specifically the Mosaic Law was only for Israel. As John's baptism, as John went out baptizing people, he only baptized those that were of the stock of Israel. So fleshly Israel is done away with, so it cannot be anything associated with the Old Testament. There are some religious people that say that the baptism for the dead means when I die, if you're baptized for me, that can save my soul. But note, it cannot be anything done to the soul by proxy. That is by someone else. Because as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. It cannot be anything that is done to a lifeless body after the spirit has been separated, nor can it be you do something for my soul that's already stepped into eternity. That cannot be. It cannot be anything to do with punishment of the soul because Jesus is the one that is going to enact punishment. And remember, hell is not a place of correction. It is a place of punishment. The baptism of fire either could be one of two ways. It would either be the destruction of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 or it is hell fire. Either way, no one wants to have the baptism of fire administered on them. Thus, our conclusion is the one baptism remaining, that is the one valid acceptable baptism that remains today binding upon all people because the apostles went out and preached the gospel into the whole world. The one baptism that remains is that of the great or some may call the apostolic commission. Why? Notice in the first place, why would we can come to this conclusion? Why is the great commission baptism the one baptism, the one valid baptism that remains? First, it is by the authority of the Father 
and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And that is specifically what Jesus says in Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All authority, all power has been given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. It has the divine approval of the entire Godhead. Notice in the second place, the reason that the one baptism remaining is that of the greater apostolic commission is because it is in water. And water is the most abundant substance on this planet. Now it should not be very difficult for anyone to come in contact with water. Do we think that God above in heaven did not understand that and did not make this world in that way? He could have commanded it in buttermilk or soda pop or whatever you want to imagine. But it is in water. And in Acts chapter 10 and verse 47, Peter at the conversion of Cornelius and his household, he says, Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized? So we note that the great or apostolic commission is by the authority of the Godhead. It involves water and it is commanded by Christ. Now if there were no other reason, that should be sufficient. In Mark 16, 16, Jesus says, He that believeth and... He didn't say or... He says, and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. It is commanded by Peter in Acts chapter 10 and verse number 48, and he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. As if Jesus Christ were not good enough, an inspired apostle of Jesus Christ, one of the original twelve, teaches the same thing. He commands Cornelius and his household to be baptized in water by the authority of the Godhead. And it is commanded to Paul. And at this time he would have been Saul by Ananias. Saul, Saul. Why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Be baptized thou. Immersed in water. Calling upon the name of the Lord. And that is obviously so his sins could be washing away, washed away. Let's define some terms now as we still consider what, what is baptism. Now note this, and we've given some English definitions here because that's a language we speak. But the Bible, and I think the honest heart recognizes, the Bible was not inspired in English. English is an ever-changing language. So the definitions that we see in English may not, and a lot of times are not, the same definitions that were used in the first century. Baptism, according to Merriam-Webster's Collegiate Dictionary, says a Christian sacrament marked by ritual use of water and admitting the recipient to the Christian community. Let me sum that up. There's nothing to it. It's just something that you go through. Baptism, according to Merriam-Webster's Collegiate 11th Edition Dictionary, basically says baptism is nothing. It's something that you just go through. It's a ritual. It's like getting up in the morning and brushing your teeth and combing your hair, putting on deodorant, whatever your, your process is in the morning, there's nothing any different in that than in what is involved in baptism. However, baptism, and the word is in the Greek language in the New Testament, that S right there stands for strongs. Now I've said this time and time again in Bible class, but I'll say it behind the pulpit. If you do not have a Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, you need one. You need to get that. That is one of the most valuable Bible tools that you'll ever have. Now instead of putting up what this word looks like in Greek, we put the Strong's number there. It is Strong's number 908. And it means immersion. It means submersion. That's what the word baptism meant in Bible times, in the New Testament times. This word, this Greek word, Strong's number 908, is used in the New Testament 22 times in the King James Version. And all the scripture that I will put up here this morning will be from the King James Version. In every single instance, this Greek word, Strong's number 908, this Greek word is translated baptism in English. However, let's look at it from the verb side. Baptize. 
And again, we'll start with Merriam-Webster's dictionary. Solely because we, we're not afraid of that dictionary, but we need to draw our own conclusions based on the inspired Word of God, not on men alone. According to Merriam-Webster, baptize means to purify or cleanse spiritually. Now notice, especially by a purging experience or ordeal. Now that implies that there is some kind of experience. There's some kind of emotional outburst. There is some kind of something that must happen to you in order for you to be baptized. However, this Greek word, and from Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, is Strong's number 907. And it means simply to make wound. To submerge. So all those things that we looked at, those seven really different type baptisms through the Bible as we read, they mean immersion. They mean to be submerged. It means to make whelmed. It means to be totally covered in whatever the substance was under the context. But we've already noted there's only one baptism remaining. This Greek word, that is strong number 907, According to my count, which sometimes is not all that great, once I get off my fingers and toes, I get a little lost. But it's, I believe it's used in the New Testament 80 times in some 65 different verses. So this is not a one-and-done word. This is not a one-and-done concept. It is constantly and consistently throughout the pages of the New Testament. This word, Strong's 907, is also translated, depending on the tense, as baptized, baptizing, and once it is translated, washed. Now remember this, and I say this as a note just to emphasize this. The Bible was not originally written in English. Merriam-Webster's dictionary might be right or it might not be right. We need to try to understand this in the biblical languages and Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, you don't have to speak Hebrew or Greek. It's got numbers. And if you can read numbers, you can turn to the back and see what these words mean. Now you can go deeper involved in that, but this will help us get a good, accurate understanding of baptism. The Bible was not originally inspired in English, but it was written in Koine Greek, and that is from the New Testament aspect of this. Note from the Scriptures here that baptism, that is immersion, it is a burial. It is likened unto a burial. And I would doubt seriously if there's anyone here that is beyond the age of 30 that has not buried some type of an animal at some point or time. Now note what the Bible says in Romans 6 beginning in verse number 3. Paul writes by inspiration, Know ye not, know you not know, that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into His death, therefore we are buried with Him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Question, what does buried mean? When Rover is dead all over, and we need to go bury Rover in the backyard, do we sprinkle dirt on Rover? Do we take a cup full of dirt and do we pour that on poor old Rover's dead body and say, all right, boys, I'm done. I buried the dog. Now I can go on about my business. Now if that were me at my house when I was growing up, my dad would say, boy, what's wrong with you? You didn't bury that dog. Get that, dig a hole in the ground and put that dog in the hole. Get that dog where I can't see him or smell him. Notice also Colossians 2, beginning in verse number 10, as we consider baptism, that is immersion, as a burial. It is a total making whelmed. It is not a sprinkling or pouring, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Paul writes again from the prison epistle here in Colossians chapter 2, And ye are complete in him, that's Christ, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom, this is Christ still, you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ. This is a spiritual circumcision. You cannot circumcise a woman. I don't care what anyone says. So this circumcision is for all people. Therefore, it is a spiritual circumcision. It is something that happens not to the physical body, but something that happens to the inner man. Notice verse 12. Buried. Buried with him in baptism or in immersion. Wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him, that's Christ, from the dead. Baptism... 
What is baptism? It is immersion. It is likened throughout the pages of inspiration as a burial. How do we bury things? We do not sprinkle or pour dirt on things that need to be buried. They must be totally whelmed. They must be totally covered by the water. In the second place, who needs baptism? Now we've talked about what baptism is. It's an immersion. There's only one baptism that remains. But now let's talk about who needs baptism. Do babies need baptism? The argument is made from time and time again, as we'll note here, that babies need to be baptized. What about those with mental deficiencies? What about those that have no mental, capa no mental capacity to understand the things contained in the gospel? Do they need baptism? Well, the argument is made sometimes from Acts 16, verses 14 and 15. The Bible says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that is through the words of the gospel, that she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Verse 15. And when she was baptized, now note that, and her household... The contention is made sometimes that, well, you know Lydia had small children. You know she had infants that were still uh, not walking age yet, that they were still crawling around on the floor or whatever it was. Because Lydia was baptized and, and her household was baptized, therefore babies need baptism. Therefore, any person, that whether they can understand or not, anybody must be baptized. Now let's continue the verse. And her household was baptized. She besought us, saying, If ye have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and abide there. And she constrained us. Now let's answer these questions. Who needs baptism? Baptism is for those who can believe the message of the gospel. In Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, yet again, Jesus says... And he said unto them, specifically the eleven, Go ye, go you all into all the world and preach the gospel. Not to just some people, not to your favorites, but to every creature. Every person you come in contact with needs to have the gospel of Jesus Christ preached unto them. And notice what he says, He that believeth. Now, what can a small infant child believe? When you tell them the, the good news of Jesus Christ to a baby that still has a, a pacifier or a baby that still may be in diapers or a child that's not walking, whatever falls into that realm of age, and you tell them about Jesus Christ, what are they going to do? Are they going to acknowledge that? How can they acknowledge that? So Jesus says, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Let me give you some information on the gospel here just as an incidental. It's on the screen. The gospel contains first facts to believe. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. It involves the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ according to the scriptures. Whereby when you read, you may understand. Second, the gospel contains commands to obey. Believe it or not, belief is a command. Now how can a small infant child believe? Therefore they are not obligated to believe. They are not susceptible to that. Thirdly, the gospel contains blessings to enjoy. Remember Ephesians 1.3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. And fourth, the gospel contains warnings to heed. 2 Thessalonians 1.7-9 In the last day, Jesus is coming back in flaming fire taking vengeance on them that first do not know God and second obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's more to the gospel than just the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Yes, that is a fundamental aspect of the gospel, but there's more to it than that. You show me a two-year-old that can understand what I just said, and I'll show you a two-year-old that needs to be baptized. You're not going to do it. Therefore, they don't need to be baptized. Baptism is for those who understand the biblical concept of repentance. Show me a two-year-old that knows what repentance means. Show me a two-year-old, matter of fact, that can say repentance. I can't say it right half the time, and I'm a grown man. In Acts 2, beginning in verse number 36, as Peter is inspired to preach the first gospel sermon, notice what happens. He says, Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Notice, now when they heard this, when they heard this message of the gospel, 
They were pricked in their heart, that is their mind. They recognized they were guilty of the sins that Peter had said and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Show me a two-year-old that will be able to understand this. When you say, you need to repent. And they say, I'm pricked in the heart, Dad. That's not going to happen. Now notice we're talking about who needs baptism. Babies don't need baptism. They cannot believe. They cannot repent. Then Peter said unto them, repent. Change your mind. Change your action. Come out from whatever your sinful state may be and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The point is, who needs baptism? Those who understand the biblical concept of repentance. Who needs baptism? Baptism is for those who are willing to confess Christ. We preached on this in some manner of speaking last week with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts 8. But note, as they, that is Philip and the eunuch and whomever may have been with the eunuch, went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? Now note, baptism is for those that are willing and able to confess Christ, to make some type of acknowledgement. I recognize what you are saying. I hear the things that you are saying and I agree with them. And I am willing to show that Jesus is the Christ. Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he, that's the eunuch, answered. He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Again, show me a two-year-old that will come up and say this when I'm done with this sermon. It's probably not going to happen. Therefore, baptism is for those who are willing to confess Christ. Notice, who needs baptism? Baptism is for those who recognize that they are lost and need to be saved. In Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, the old inspired prophet Isaiah writes, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. Notice also Romans 3.23. The contention is made, all means all. Well, let's take that from the concept of everything we just said. Romans 3.23, Paul says, For all have sinned. All includes babies, right? Right? For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, but we must take the principle of qualification. You may hear it referred to as Scripture interprets Scripture. In Ezekiel 18.20, as we have preached on a few weeks ago, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. What is sin? 1 John 3, 4. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of law. It is sin is lawlessness. Sin is something that someone must do. Sin is something that must take place somehow, somewhere. Children are not guilty of sin. When all they have done is been born into this world, when they've just been conceived, there's no guilt on their part. Thus, babies are not sinful. They are not full of sin. Notice also from Acts 16 and verse 30, where we have the Philippian jailer, where Paul and Silas are in prison. They're beaten in the inner prison. They're singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs unto the Father. They're praying, and a miraculous earthquake comes, and everyone's chains are loose, but no one runs off. And the jailer's about to kill himself because he figures everybody's gone. Hey, before they treat me the way that these men were treated, I'll just kill myself. But Paul says, hold on right there, son. Don't, we're all here. And notice what this jailer says. If everyone would have this attitude, the world would be a better place. He recognized that there was something he had to do. And brought them out, Acts 16.30, and said, Sirs, what must I do? What must I do to be saved? If we could only get people to recognize that, how much better would the world be? Who needs baptism? Baptism is for those who recognize that they are lost and they need saved. In the third place, our third question, why be baptized? Why be baptized? Why be baptized according to the Scriptures? First, because scriptural baptism places us into Christ. In Galatians 3, 26 and following it says, For you are all the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. It starts with faith. 
It starts with conviction. It starts with confidence in God and His Word. Verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Where does a man get into Christ? Where does an individual get into Christ? When they're baptized. Scripturally, they are placed into Christ where all spiritual blessings are found. And notice the distinction. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. The gospel is for everyone. Every person needs to be baptized because scriptural baptism places us into Christ and that is of the age of accountability and of a sound mind. Why be baptized? Because scriptural baptism allows Christ to add us unto His church. Notice I said allows. I said that for a reason. Jesus Christ, the Godhead, is never going to work contrary to their word. So who does Jesus add to the church? Notice what the Bible says in Acts 2. We've already talked about verses 36 through 38. But notice who it is that is baptized. Then they that madly, nope. Then they that sadly, nope. Then they that gladly received His word were baptized. What were they baptized for? The remission of sins. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 47. Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord. Notice that. You don't join the church. You don't go join the church of your choice. The Lord Himself adds you to His church. And the Lord added to the church, not a church, but the church, the called out daily, such as should be saved. Why be baptized? Because it will allow Christ to add you to His church. Why be baptized? Because in accordance with our belief and repentance and confession of Christ, scriptural baptism washes away our sins. Baptism alone does nothing. Did you hear what I said? Baptism in and of by itself does nothing. We cannot go grab people and baptize them and tell them that they're saved, that they've been added to the body of Christ. There's something that must go on in your mind. And that involves belief, repentance, and confession. In Acts 22, 16, as we've already noted, Ananias tells this to Saul, but where it's recorded here, Paul, the apostle of Christ, is repeating this. He is saying what was said to him, And now Ananias told Saul, Why, why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Why? And wash away thy sins calling on the name of the Lord. Some may say and assert that calling on the name of the Lord means pray. Read Acts chapter 2. Peter said, This is that spoken by Joel the prophet. Joel said, Whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Show me one time in Acts chapter 2 where Peter told anyone to pray. You won't find it. Why be baptized? Because in accordance with our belief and repentance and confession of Christ, scriptural baptism cleanses our consciences. As our scripture reading said in 1 Peter chapter 3, really verses 18 through 22, but notice very carefully verses 20 and 21, which sometime were disobedient. That was the people in the day of Noah, in the universal flood of Noah's day, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. What saved Noah and those with him on the ark? It doesn't say the ark anywhere in the Bible. It says that Noah and those with him were saved by water. Now, are we saved by water? Note what the next verse says very carefully. The like figure, the antitype, wherein even not water, it doesn't say water saves us. Water saved Noah. What saves us today? The like figure wherein to even baptism. Which baptism? The one valid baptism that remains. It just so happens to be in water. But water does not save us. Baptism doth also now. Now save us. How? It's not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. If you need a bath, take a bath. If you need a shower, take a shower. But if your soul stinks, if your conscience needs cleansing, there's something that will do that, friend. And Peter says, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Water does not save us. Water saved Noah. Baptism saves us and it saves us now. Why be baptized? Because scriptural baptism places us into the kingdom 
of the Father's dear Son. There's a lot of confusion going around about the kingdom. It's not really that difficult when you actually look at the Bible. Notice what Paul writes in Colossians 1 beginning in verse 13. Who hath delivered us, past tense, from the power of darkness and hath translated us, past tense, into the kingdom of His dear Son. Paul was alive in the flesh when he wrote the book of Colossians and Paul knew I'm in the kingdom. I know where I am. I know I am alive and in the kingdom. How did Paul know that? Look at verse 14. In whom, that's Christ, the kingdom, we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Now back it up. The forgiveness of sins equals redemption. Those redeemed are translated into the kingdom. Those in the kingdom are those that have been delivered from the power of darkness. You can't miss that. You can't, you need help to miss that. You can be alive in this body and be in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's not premillennial, postmillennial, any other type of millennial you want to make it. It is here now. Why be baptized? Because only those in the kingdom will be in heaven with God for all eternity. Now it hits home. Now we see how important it is to be in the kingdom. In 1 Corinthians 15, beginning in verse number 24, Paul still writes here, Then cometh the end, that's the last day, when he shall have delivered up what? The kingdom. What's going to heaven? The kingdom. What does the kingdom consist of? People. What kind of people? Those that have been redeemed. Those delivered from the power of sin. Those that have redemption. Those that have the forgiveness of sins. You can't miss everything else that we've gone through. Baptism is for the remission of sins. Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all authority and power, for he must reign, that's Jesus Christ, till he hath put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death, that is physical death. In the last day, when everything, the earth is no more, what's going to heaven? Who's going to heaven? Those in the kingdom. Now that hurts. If you're not in the kingdom, you're not going to heaven. If you're not scripturally baptized, you're not in the kingdom and therefore you are lost. Now let's draw some conclusions quickly. What have we talked about? What has all this up here been for? Notice these conclusions. First, the baptism of the Bible is likened unto a burial. In order for someone or something to be properly buried, it must be totally whelmed or submerged. We recognize that. The one baptism that remains is a burial. The Koine Greek language is very precise. That is the language the New Testament was written in. You don't have to know all these words. Look at the different numbers. Baptism is 908. Baptize is 907. If that were the case, the Greeks had words for sprinkle. They had words for pour. Why did the Holy Spirit not use them? Because baptism never as used in the Bible, it never means sprinkle or pour, but thirdly, it always means immersion. It never, ever means sprinkle or pour. Fourth, babies and those who do not have the capacity to comprehend the message of the gospel are not eligible to be baptized. They're not lost. They don't have any recognizing power. Sin is the transgression of the law. Babies don't need baptism. Fifth, baptism is an act of faith for faith comes by hearing the Word of God. It's all over the New Testament. Baptism, be baptized, those type things. It's everywhere throughout the pages of inspiration. Sixth, baptism is not, let me repeat this and go a little slower. Baptism is not something someone does because they are saved. It is something done in order to be saved. There is no such thing as being saved and then baptized. That's not the case. The Bible does not teach that. We are baptized in order to be saved. Seventh, baptism must be preceded, that is beforehand, by faith, repentance, and confession of Christ. If a person has no faith, don't be baptized. If you're not willing to repent, don't be baptized. If you're not willing to confess Christ, don't be baptized. But if you're willing to do those things, then baptism will save you. Eighth, Baptism must be followed, as it has some things that precede baptism. Baptism must be followed with dedicated and faithful service for as long as we remain alive in this life. It's not a one and done. Do you understand? It's not a one and done. It's not you come get baptized, you come have me lay my hands on you, and then I never see you again. That is not what biblical baptism is. 
This is dedication from the devil to God. We must turn. Ninth, there is no mystical or magical power in the water. And we said that very plainly, and the Bible says that in 1 Peter 3. Water doesn't save you. Baptism saves you. It just so happens that we are officially baptized in water. There is power in the precious blood of Jesus Christ. That's where the remission of sins is contained, is in Christ's blood. We meet Christ's blood in the water. And tenth, every accountable soul under the sound of my voice or the soul that reads these words with understanding needs to be baptized immediately in order to be saved from the soul-condemning power of sin. Where standest thou? Are you ready? I don't know how much plainer I could make it. I don't know how much longer I could preach on this. I think it's been fairly efficient, and that's my own judgment. There's nothing else I need to say other than now is the time that you need to come. You need to meet me up front right now as together we stand and sing the song.